Oh Lord God Almighty. Oh Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're gonna sing, sing, sing for you. Gonna sing, sing, sing for you. Lord God Almighty. Oh Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're gonna sing, sing, sing for you. Gonna sing, sing, sing for you. I say we're gonna work and pray and sing every day for you. Gonna work and pray and sing every day for you. Oh Lord God Almighty. Oh Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're gonna live, live, live for you. Gonna live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Oh Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're gonna live, live, live for you. Gonna live, live, live for you. I say we're gonna work and pray. And live every day for you. you gonna work uh -huh. and pray. Oh yeah. And live every day for you. Sing it, Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're gonna die, die, die for you. Gonna die, die, die for you. Sing it, Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're gonna die, die, die for you. Gonna die, die, die for you. I say we're gonna work. And pray and die every day for you. You're gonna work uh -huh. and pray. Oh yeah, and die every day for you. Sing Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Sing Lord God Almighty. Lord God Almighty. Sing Lord God Almighty. Lord God Almighty. Sing Lord God Almighty. Lord God Almighty. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. I want defense. Grace is found is where you are and where you You're my hope and stay.
Good morning and welcome to Valley Christian. We are so glad that you have joined us this morning. I wanted to remind you that next week is Resurrection Sunday, and we will be having a special service in the park at Cornerstone Park in Henderson, Nevada at 10 a.m. Lunch will be served. So if you are in the area and are used to watching service online, I want to send a special invitation to you to come out and join with us in celebrating the Lord's resurrection at 10 a.m. Lunch will be served afterwards, so bring a chair, bring a friend, and let's have a great time. Let's go to God in a word of prayer before we get started on Matthew chapter 27. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your blessings and your love. We thank you so much for just the way that you move mightily in our lives. We know, Father, that there are so many things going on in this world right now. We know that there are people who are in the midst of conflict, in the midst of war, God, not just in Europe and Africa, in the Middle East and in many other places, God. Uh, there are people in need of you all over the world. And we pray, Father, that you will work miracles, that you will work mightily in the lives of people, that they may find you, that they may be saved, and that they may search you out, Father. God, we just pray that as your followers or would-be followers, that we will open up our lives, open up our minds to uh, what you have for us this morning. Father, as we study out Christ crucified, I pray that we can uh, really respond to it in a way that is glorifying to you and in a way that results in great gratitude. Thank you for all that you have done and thank you for all that you do. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Matthew chapter 27, uh, simply titled Crucified. You know, this particular passage or this particular chapter uh, definitely marks a crucial time in Christian history, in all of world history, because it's when Jesus died for our sins. It's when Jesus took on the sins of the world, and basically it allows us to have that relationship with God. But I just want us to understand that it's just half the story. As awesome as it is for Jesus to have died for us, What's even more important is that, is that he rose from the dead. And that's why we put so much emphasis on the resurrection. Uh, yes, we take communion every week, and, and this will serve as our communion message. Uh, but it's always, 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 always important to remember that he rose from the dead. That that miracle is what sealed the deal. And what made everything up to that point valid is because he rose from the dead. And so the reason why I wanted to emphasize this is because we're not going to talk about the resurrection in this particular chapter, but we're going to talk about it uh, next week as we conclude uh, Matthew chapter 28 together in the park. Uh, there will be an on online shortened uh, Easter uh, sermon online, but again, we, we really want you to join us in the park if at all possible. So... I want us to start with Matthew chapter 20, actually, because Jesus told his disciples very specifically what was going to happen when he entered into Jerusalem. In Matthew chapter 20, before he entered into Jerusalem triumphantly on the donkey, he says now in verse Matthew chapter 20, verse 17, now Jesus was going to Jerusalem on the way. He took the 12 aside and said to them, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Now, why is this important? Because Jesus didn't want his disciples to be caught by surprise, but he gave them a warning, a very specific warning of what was going to happen when he, when he entered into Jerusalem. And I want you to think about how they must have taken this. So there's, there's probably several ways you could take it, but some of the ways that you could have taken it is, okay, Jesus is saying what might possibly happen. And he's telling us this so that we can, we can prevent it or we can stop it somehow. Or this is what's going to happen if we don't do anything. And 
For some disciples, namely like a Peter, as, we, as Lester did a great job last week of going through Matthew chapter 26, and if you haven't read it or watched that video, I encourage you to do so. Um, Peter struck the servant of the people that came to arrest Jesus and cut off an ear. And in that way, Peter might have thought, oh, I'm going to stop what Jesus predicted. Judas, knowing that this was going to happen, who was, uh, by, by many uh, scholars' accounts, was a zealot, probably did what he did, as many uh, speculate. He did what he did to try to force Jesus' hand to actually take action against what he just got through saying. He thought that if he could arrange a meeting between Jesus and these chief priests and teachers of the law, maybe he can force Jesus' hand to actually bring in the kingdom. For Judas, it was probably a misunderstanding of the coming of the kingdom, of what Jesus has been talking about. And again, there's a lot of speculation. I, I, I don't subscribe to the fact that Judas just didn't believe in Jesus. I, I think he misunderstood Jesus and did something very Maybe it may, just something very wrong because of his misunderstanding and his desire to see something other than what Jesus was trying to, to do. But again, that's up for debate. That's up for speculation. You'll find people on all sorts of the spectrums. But what we do know is Jesus predicted his death. He predicted his uh, flogging, his crucifixion, his mocking. So it, wasn't a, it shouldn't have been a surprise to his disciples. And so I want to start in chapter 27, go back to chapter 27, and start reading. And just like Lester, I'm going to read and give a little bit of commentary, but so much of what we're going to read speaks for itself. And so I want to encourage you to listen. I want to encourage you to try to put yourself in the scene, in this situation, the way his disciples would have seen it, to really begin to understand the magnitude, to understand the, uh, the feelings that they must have been feeling seeing their rabbi, their beloved rabbi, uh, mocked and flogged and crucified and dying. Early in the morning, verse 1, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as the burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by the, by the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Now, this is definitely a picture of worldly sorrow versus godly sorrow that we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. A couple of things to bring to mind. Number one, this particular scene is not in chronological order. This really took place after Jesus was condemned to death. Up to this point, uh, maybe Judas was hoping and, and praying that the outcome would be different. But when he realized Jesus was condemned to death, he was seized with remorse and, and he basically return the 30 pieces of silver. And you can read uh, some of this in Zechariah chapter 11 and Jeremiah chapter 19, where you see some of the same wording in, in the references to the 30 pieces of silver, the potter's field, and throwing those 30 pieces of silver into the house of God. And these things that 
Matthew ties back to the Old Testament is significant because, again, his audience is Jewish. And so they're seeing Judas play something out that was recorded in the Old Testament. But like I said, this was something that was a sorrow that was very worldly. Some would contend that Peter did something worse than what Judas did. See, Judas didn't know that Jesus was going to end up dead. He didn't realize he was going to condemn Jesus. He was hoping for a different outcome. Peter, on the other hand, denied Jesus three times, basically saying that though I was chosen to serve this rabbi, I reject him as my rabbi. I don't know the man as my rabbi. He rejected Jesus, something to the Jewish mindset far worse than maybe what Judas did in intent. And yet Judas didn't go back to Jesus. Peter eventually ended up in front of Jesus who restored him. And that was recorded in the book of John. And I believe that this is so important for us to understand that Jesus, the story and the narrative of Jesus is one of hope. Now, a lot of people will say, well, you know, would Jesus have taken Judas back? And, you know, there's a lot of speculation. This is what happened. But this, I believe, is not the story that Jesus wants played out in the lives of those who sin, in the lives of those who feel helpless or, or hopeless. I, I believe God wants people to come to a repentance that leads to life. All of us who are viewing this or listening to this, we have an opportunity, if we're not in a relationship with God, to repent and come to Jesus. Because that is why Jesus died. That is why he came back to life. So that we can repent, have a mind change that leads to a heart change, that leads to behavior change that can lead to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we cannot be controlled by our emotions. Emotions not tempered by the word of God will not lead us in the right direction. We need the word of God really guiding our emotions as we live out this life. Let's get back to the text in verse 11. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor. So we went from after he was condemned with Judas back to before he was condemned and on trial. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now, it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which one of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked, asked, they all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate, but they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar, uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. You know, this pretty intense passage of scripture, this scene of Barabbas being set free. And in some gospels talk about he was, it talks about that he was a murderer and 
he was released. If you really think about it, Barabbas was the very first person to benefit from the death or the condemnation of Jesus Christ. But what we see is that nobody is innocent. No one is innocent. Just because Pilate washed his hands in front of the crowd and pronounced himself innocent. Well, Pilate's not the ultimate judge. Pilate could have released Jesus. Pilate could have made that decision. And again, here we go into this whole this discussion of free will and God's will and sovereignty and a choice. God knew what Pilate would do. He knew that Pilate would succumb to the pressure of the crowd. He knew that Pilate would have to, by reason of his position, punish someone who was known as a king or, or a threat to Rome. But what is so intense is that statement by the Jewish people. And again, remember, they were persuaded by the chief priests and, and the elders. And that statement that his blood is on us and our children. You know, it, it goes back to just understanding that choices have consequences. I don't believe that all this happened for, just by happenstance, it happened for a reason. And I believe that some of that judgment came at the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. But bottom line is this, nobody is innocent. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, it says, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, talking about Jesus, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. You know, it would be easy to assign blame to Pilate, uh, assign blame to the chief priests and, and the elders, which they did take, take initiative to really kill Jesus and, and to take him before Pilate, hand him over to the Gentiles. And, you know, if there's anyone to, to, that, that deserves the majority blame, it absolutely would be them. But we also have to understand that Jesus died for all of our sins. That God's grace caused Jesus to atone for all of our sins. And we have to respond. If the act of what Jesus did is to be applied to our lives. See, Jesus died so that we can have that opportunity to have our sins washed away, atoned for, and to have that relationship with God. Many from the first century till now, reject, dismiss, don't accept what Jesus did on the cross. I pray that we don't do the same. I pray that those of us who have, who have really embraced by faith what Jesus did on the cross, that we live a life of gratitude. I mean, you, you think about this. I remember when I studied the Bible and read this, and my wife, when she studied the Bible and, and she read this, it changed our perspective of what Christianity is all about. It went from a list of do's and don'ts to a list of what can I do out of gratitude for my salvation for the Lord who died for me and rose again. I pray that that's your attitude. I pray that serving Christ is not just a list of do's and don'ts, checklists. I pray that it is an one long act of gratitude. Because he died for our sins. So that we could have a relationship with God. So that we could be saved. So that we can live a life for him out of gratitude. Verse 27, then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into, into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him, dozens on dozens. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand 
Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. You know, Isaiah chapter 53 talks about the suffering servant. That is definitely a messianic passage of scripture describing what Jesus would go through as a servant of God for us. You know, if you ever read a medical account of what Jesus went through, after the scourging and the beating, after he was whipped and his back ripped open by the, the flagellum or the cat of nine tails, while his back is bloody, oozing blood, then they stick this robe on him. And probably, probably leave it on long enough for it to become sticky and stuck to the wounds. And then they rip it off afresh to expose the wounds, to start the bleeding all over again. And then he goes to be crucified. He went through a massive trauma. And in Isaiah chapter 53, starting in verse 2, it says, He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by my, mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon, was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. This is what Jesus went through for us. How grateful and thankful we should be for his act of bravery and courage and sacrifice that we could have a relationship with God Almighty. Going on in verse 32, as they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Two rebels, probably zealots, were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said. But he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. And in the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. You know, I always found this kind of strange because every picture that we usually see of uh, Calvary is uh, on a hill far away and there's usually three crosses and you know there's it's out in this field it's it's but you know when we traveled to Israel the the thing that they reminded us of is when they crucified people they would often crucify people near a road so that they can see what would happen to anybody that would go against Rome. And so picture Jesus and this, these two other rebels on their crosses on the side of the road. And people walking by, passing by, seeing these guys on the cross and mocking them. People who they knew were going to die, mocking them. But especially 
this guy possibly in the middle, possibly the Son of God, and saying stuff like, hey, if you come down, we'll believe in you. Rescue yourself. Call on God. He'll save you. Does any of this sound familiar? Well, to me, it always struck me as strange because... If in Luke chapter 4, verse 13, it says, when the devil had finished all this tempting, remember Jesus being tempted out in the wilderness. It says he left him until an opportune time. I think this was that opportune time. If you are the son of God, turn this rock into bread because you're hungry. If you're the son of God, come off the cross because you're in pain. Cast yourself off the highest temple and the God will save you. Call on God and he'll save you from the cross. Hey, if you just bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. If you come off that cross, we will worship you. We will serve you. Sound familiar? I think Satan found his opportune time to tempt Jesus. And I believe he was tempted. Because he stated that he could call down legions of angels to save him. And yet Jesus willfully stayed on that cross. No matter how much he was ridiculed. No matter how much he was mocked. I mean, think about the two robbers on either side, probably uh, robbers, uh, two rebels on either side, probably zealots, are looking at Jesus saying, this guy's not a zealot. He wouldn't even make our camp. He wouldn't even make the cut as a zealot. How could you consider this guy a zealot? Now, we know that one guy came to his senses before his death, but can you imagine even people who were dying were making fun of the Son of God? This was that opportune time that Satan was looking for to tempt Jesus. And yet, he showed incredible restraint and self-control and obedience and sacrifice and stayed on the cross. Verse 45, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemme sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. The unimaginable and the unexplained. The unimaginable for a mother to watch her son die in such a graphic, inhumane way. The unimaginable of what the disciples thought about and probably could never imagine that it would be or go down like this. Even though Jesus told them, I don't think they ever imagined it can go down in this way. Darkness, rock splitting, uh, tombs opening, earthquakes, tombs breaking open and the resurrection of holy people and entering into the city after his resurrection. All of this led to the proclamation by Gentiles, surely he was the son of God. A proclamation that Jesus' own people never made, never believed. But Gentiles did. Now, I always thought, what am I going to say 
when I get to this part of Matthew about the dead being raised and and all that. And honestly, I I don't know what to say. And the reason why I don't know what to say is because Matthew didn't even say anything else about it. The, The strangest thing in probably all of Scripture And Matthew and the scriptures are silent. I think history books are silent. And so you have all this speculation. You know what? You can read it on your own. I don't want to sit here and speculate. All I know is the Bible said the bodies of many many holy people who had died were raised to life. And you can read in the Old Testament scriptures and prophecies about the dead coming back to life, holy people coming back to life. You could read in the New Testament the talk about that the, the dead in Christ shall rise first. That you, you could do all this connecting and, and speculating. But you know, Matthew is silent. He's silent on the, the you know, literally the first zombie apocalypse, so to speak, you know, but they weren't the living dead. They they were alive. They were they were brought back to life. So they weren't like dead people just reanimated. But I think what we should be in awe of is that when Jesus gave up his spirit, it wasn't taken from him. It was given up by him. Once again, demonstrating his willingness to lay down his life for us. I leave it to you to do your own research about the unexplained But understand, if the Bible didn't explain it, we're just speculating. Verse 57, as evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. This guy, and I heard this from uh, my wife who heard this from a sister, uh, I believe in the Middle East, that asked this question. What did Joseph have to gain by putting Jesus in his own new tomb. Think about it. Joseph had become a disciple and asked, asked for Jesus' body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and put it in the tomb. Now, I don't know if Joseph did this because he believed Jesus was going to raise again on the third day, but as my Bible doesn't tell me he was there on the third day. So what did Joseph have to gain? What what kind of kudos was he seeking? What kind of blessing was he seeking from Jesus, who was dead? I believe he did this because if he was a disciple of Jesus, Jesus was his rabbi. And he loved his rabbi. He loved the Son of God. And I look at this and I say, why do we do what we do? Do we do it for the blessing? Do we do it because he's Jesus? He's our Messiah, our Savior, our rabbi, the one that we follow, the one whom we would die for, the one that if he were never to bless us with one thing ever again, we would still serve him wholeheartedly because it's not about the things It's about him. I say we imitate Joseph and give of our lives, give of ourselves, not to receive, but because of who Jesus truly is. Verse 62, the next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. 
Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. You know, Jesus was guarded out of fear because the story wasn't over. Even his persecutors were like, you know, if he rose from the dead or even if his disciples stole the body and told the people that he rose from the dead, that would be horrible for them. And we, if you've been around it for any length of time, you've heard that Jesus is either Lord or, or he's a liar, he's a legend, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. You know, and I'm not going to go through that. Again, you can find this all online. It's, it's not new stuff. But I, I want you to understand something. They were guarding against the greatest miracle to ever happen. Out of fear that their lives would be proven a lie. That their ways would be proven false. That Jesus would be proven correct and truly the Son of God. What are we guarding our lives against? What are we putting guards in front of our hearts to prevent? You know, as we take communion and as we remember Jesus, I want to take the time to read Psalm 22. Because bottom line is this. There are really only two sides on this, in, on, in this entire planet, those with Jesus and those not with Jesus. Those that believe and live their lives according to his teachings and those that don't. Where do you fall in? Where do you want to fall in? I pray that we will take this crucifixion account to heart. Because he died for us. He did this for us. So that we didn't have to necessarily do that. But that we could live for him. By faith, we can live for him out of gratitude. Let's read Psalm 22. A psalm that is very messianic prophetic, and something that Matthew referred to a lot directly and indirectly, and the gospel writers referred to a lot directly or indirectly. So I'm going to read this, and then we're going to pray, and we'll take communion together. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but, do not, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted you and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. They say, let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's room, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot shared, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. 
All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord. For he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship all who go down to dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Prosperity, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to the people yet unborn, he has done it. Jesus has done it. And for that we are forever grateful. Let's go to God in a word of prayer before we take communion. Heavenly Father, you are incredible. You're awesome. You're gracious and you're kind. As we take communion, we do so in remembrance of Jesus, his sacrifice, his body broken, God, his blood spilled for the forgiveness of our sin. Father, as he died, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The very hand of God opening the way for man to approach you in relationship through the broken body and spilled blood of Jesus Christ. Father, help us to engage you, to trust you, to love you, and to obey you. You gave your son. Let us give our lives. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you for joining us. We are so glad that you did. If you want more information about Valley Christian, please go to valleychristians.org. That's valleychristians with an S dot org. There you can find more information about us. You can sign up for Bible studies. You can get more information about small groups around the valley if you would like. And you're also able to give online if you would like to do that as well. Again, we are an imperfect people serving a perfect God. Let's journey together. God bless and we'll see you next time.